Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the July edition of Restore America's Estuaries Coastal Resilience webinar series. My name is Rob Shane. I am the communications manager here at Ray. Uh, we're happy to have you uh, along for the ride. We've got a couple of excellent panelists lined up, uh, ready to share some success stories and uh, opportunities for engagement, uh, specifically from the sporting community, the fishing and hunting and outdoor recreation community. Um, but before we get into that, I've got a couple of updates I look forward to sharing with you. Uh, first, a little bit of background about Ray. We are an organization made up of 10 of the leading coastal conservation organizations across the country with representation uh, on the East, West, and Gulf Coast. Uh, we also have a handful of affiliate members, which you see there at the bottom of your screen, um, that support us as well and are uh, integral part of the work we do here at Ray. So if you're interested in becoming an affiliate member, feel free to reach out to us after the webinar. Um, on another note, we are excited to announce that registration for the 2022 Coastal and Estuarine Summit, hosted by Restore America's Estuaries, and in partnership with our member group in Louisiana, the Coast Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana, uh, is now open. You can learn more about the event, uh, as well as register today at the link there at the bottom, raysummit2022.estuaries.org. We're looking forward to seeing you all down in New Orleans with us this December 4th through the 8th. A um, couple other events coming up, uh, September 17th through 24th is the uh, annual National Estuaries Week uh, in partnership with our friends at the National Estuarine Research Reserve Association and the Association of National Estuary Programs. We're excited to bring you this week-long campaign to highlight the importance of estuaries and uh, their impact on your local economy, as well as climate change and uh, other coastal benefits for fish and wildlife. Um, more information will be coming out about that soon, and uh, we look forward to having you join us on that campaign as well. Uh, next, just a little bit about why we're here today. We're here celebrating NOAA's Habitat Month. Uh, each July, NOAA puts on this campaign to highlight the importance of habitat uh, to our coastal ecosystems and coastal economies. Uh, you'll see on your screen there just a few statistics about how habitat uh, provides, excuse me, provides for not only the economy, but also uh, communities across the country. Um, importantly, 40% uh, of the U.S. population and 47% of the U.S. gross domestic product actually comes from estuary regions. So protecting habitat not only provides for your traditional economies, but it also prevents millions and millions of dollars in damage each year from storms. Uh, and last but not least, why you're here. Uh, we're excited to announce uh, the three speakers that will be joining us today. Uh, first, we have Tiffany Turner. She is the Director of Climate Solutions for the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, also known as TRCP. She is leading a coalition of conservationists to advance natural climate solutions and working to build support and shift mindsets for climate solutions while advancing climate mitigation, adaptation, and resilience policies. Tiffany holds a master's degree in public health from the University of Michigan, where she focused on environmental health specifically. Uh, next, from the Bonefish and Tarpon Trust, uh, we have Joellen Wilson, uh, and she is the Juvenile Tarpon Habitat Program Manager, where she is in charge of all juvenile tarpon habitat research projects from South Carolina to the Florida Keys. This includes mapping, identification, and restoration of juvenile tarpon habitats and education to the public through presentations. Joellen completed her master's degree in fisheries and aquatic sciences at the University of Florida, where her research focused on juvenile tarpon habitat use. And last but not least, we have Greg Green, the Director of Conservation Programs in the Pacific Northwest for Ducks Unlimited, or DU. Greg is responsible for oversight of DU's conservation programs in Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, Utah, and Washington. Following a master's degree in coastal ecology from Texas A&M University, Greg became a restoration practitioner with a diverse portfolio including estuarine and palustrine wetlands, intertidal and subtidal reefs, floodplain and forested wetlands, and grasslands. In his 20 plus years with DU, he has developed and coordinated DU's involvement in Puget Sound, Oregon, and Washington coasts, as well as the San Francisco Bay Delta region and the Texas Gulf Coast. 
Uh, we look forward to great presentations from all three of our panelists, and we will have a Q&A session at the end. So without further ado, I'm happy to kick it over to Tiffany to start us off. Thanks, Rob, for that introduction. You know, I think the beauty of NOAA's Habitat Month is that it prompts you to take a look at the environment around you and realize there's a lot more to it than you first see. They're all unique and really important to their inhabitants for sure, but there are so many layered co-benefits that are in place. Nurseries, breeding grounds, seasonal ranges. They're working hard for wildlife and they're working hard for us. So thanks for doing this. You can go to the next slide. So I'll tell you guys a little bit about the TRCP. Uh, we are a conservation focused nonprofit and our vision is noted here that we want to unite and amplify our partners voices to advance America's legacy of conservation, habitat and access. We have five centers that we focus on for advocacy of conservation policy. They're public lands, private lands and ag, marine fisheries, water and climate that I'm representing today. We have um, very serious. We have a very serious feeling about the letter P in partnership uh, for TRCP. We have 61 formal NGO partners that we convene to, to gather together to be able to do this work. We have 25 or over 25 corporate partners, over 25 ambassadors and former board members, and over 130,000 individual members and supporters. And when I say that we are um, nonpartisan, I really mean it. We, we strive to be more than just bipartisan. We work with our partners to help identify areas of consensus in conservation, and we continue to coordinate um, and work towards shared priorities. So there's really, we found impact and influence when presenting a united front to lawmakers, and that's how we try to approach all of our work in conservation for habitat. Next slide. Uh, hunters and anglers have a long history of supporting habitat conservation. So the Pittman-Robertson Act was signed into law in 1937, and it took an existing excise tax on ammunition, firearms, archery equipment, and it tied it to funding for wildlife restoration. So over the life of the program, 15 billion has gone to states for habitat restoration and acquisition. And Dingle Johnson in 1950, doubling down on the, the success of Pittman-Robertson, decided to do the same for fishing and boating products, as well as some fuels. So $6.9 billion for fisheries projects has gone through that act. And then there's the Duck Stamp Act. So the full, I think 98% of the cost of duck stamps goes directly to conserve wildlife habitat, uh, specifically the Migratory Bird Conservation Fund, where they purchase or, or lease wetlands and wildlife habitat for inclusion in the National Wildlife Refuge System. Then there's all um, license sales. There's hunting and fishing license sales. Those proceeds go back to the states for conservation and restoration of habitat. Of course, uh, the partners that are presenting with me today would be able to say they wouldn't be able to do the work without the, the private dollars and the labor that's associated with getting the work done a lot of that is coming from hunting and fishing organizations as well as interested donors. So what this really means is that we're supporting and entrusting state and fish, state fish and wildlife agencies, sorry, um, with providing scientifically based management of our resources of the habitat that we know and love. Next slide. So the TRCP recently completed a nationwide poll of hunters and anglers on climate and environmental issues. And what you're looking at here is the result of one of the questions asked to participants about problems that they see that are affecting fish and wildlife. So threats to habitat came out as clear issues. Either they're being broken up by development or industry or roads and highways are, are impacting them. And you'll note also that climate change is listed pretty high as recognized as a threat to habitat and wildlife. And that's where my program comes in. Next slide. So the poll also told us that 72% of hunters and anglers believe climate change is happening. And that's across party lines and really confirms a shift in thinking in the community. A majority also agreed that climate change is already or will affect their ability to hunt and fish and their children's ability to hunt and fish. So hunters and anglers are seeing a lot of changes on the landscape, some that they're connecting to climate change, some that they're not, but, but we know they are. So you see shifts in season ranges or migration patterns. Um, example of that is Alaska. They've got rising temperatures. In fact, temperatures in Alaska are growing 
at twice the rate as any other state. And that also means that shrubs and plants are growing taller in the longer growing season naturally. And that's causing moose to spread into the tundra. And that becomes this, not only are they not supposed to be there, because that's not their normal range, but it becomes a negative cycle leading to more permafrost thaw, which is releasing more methane and not capture or not trapping the carbon, not being the sink that it's supposed to be. We're also seeing earlier or later season start times. And that means it, we're we having lower growing, se longer growing seasons. And that means more invasive species and pests that now we need more money to manage. We have waters that are too low or too hot to fish last summer, man, saw so many rivers in the West closed to fishing with waters either too hot or too low for catch and release because it would be traumatizing to them. Um, reduced snow cover and, or early and increased thaw. Last summer, we also saw a heat wave, heat wave in Washington. Um, I think it was Mount Rainier's snow levels. They dropped so dramatically, so quickly that it caused the Nisqually rivers to wash out the trails and bridges and it just ravaged, ravaged habitats there. And then we have habitats degraded and fragmented. Obviously everyone's seeing this more, more in the media, drought, fire and flooding, the entirety of the West Coast, West Coast including New Mexico and Colorado are just having such extreme fire damage. And we can't go without mentioning saltwater intrusion, sea level rise and subsidence all along the Gulf and Atlantic coasts that are impacting everything from habitat to farms to basic infrastructure. And with the Mississippi River losing nearly um, a football field of wetlands every 100 minutes or so, it's really hard to ignore. And it's hard for hunters and anglers to ignore. And we're helping them to make that connection to what they're already seeing. So these issues are all a call to action in addition to our community's concerns. So in 2020, the TRCP gathered our partners and put out a climate statement with 41 partners signing on. And we acknowledge the need for a national strategy to reduce greenhouse gases, but focused on where we're credible, nature-based solutions. We know aggressive implementation of nature-based solutions can mitigate around 20% or more of emissions as long as they're active and happy and healthy uh, ecosystems. So we kicked off a working group with our partners where we have currently prioritized coastal and blue carbon habitats. So blue carbon ecosystems have the potential to store up to 25 million tons of carbon dioxide a year. And they also provide habitat for fish and other marine species. They stabilize the shorelines and they support recreational fishing. So we're all in. Um, agriculture and the Farm Bill, it's Farm Bill season in DC and preparing for the conversations that connect habitat, climate, and agricultural practices is really critical. So we're gonna be working on that even more lately. And then making sure that over trillion dollars in infrastructure funding hits the ground with a nature-based lens everywhere it can. There's at least $2 billion in NOAA habitat restoration project funding that we see as critical and are following pretty closely. And we're also focused on education and outreach in this space. We know that not everyone understands nature-based solutions or the value that they provide. And one way we're tackling that is through a tool or map to highlight successful implementation of nature-based solutions to help people really get it. Uh, next slide, Rob. So this is just a screenshot of the website because it's due to launch next week along with a whole new climate site for TRCP where we'll have the full poll results mentioning the poll, they'll all be there. And the idea here is that you click on any green state and a pop-out box will give you information, great information about a specific project or an area that's working for habitat resilience and climate. Healthy habitats, they work so hard for climate uh, as well as wildlife by absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. They store it and they improve water quality and quantity. They reduce erosion. They prevent and reduce the intensity of wildfires. They enhance soil health. The list goes on and on, and they're strengthening coastlines as well. So um, we want to be able to put these examples out there, fill up the map completely. And not only are we showing members of Congress, members of our community, anyone who, who gets to the site what nature-based solutions are, but we're also highlighting and amplifying our, our partners because most of these projects are those that are being done by the wonderful partners who are on the panel today. And um, I think the next slide's my last. Yeah. Thanks, I ran through that pretty quickly.
Thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, greatly appreciate that. And uh, some seriously, you know, helpful information there on, on some background and some other stuff. Um, next, we'll go over to Joe Ellen. Uh, and I will let you all know that, unfortunately, Greg is having some technical issues and uh, may not be able to, to join us as expected. Um, we're hoping he can he can get it figured out, but uh, if not, uh, we'll just make the Q&A part here at the end uh, a little bit longer. So without uh, any more, let me get your slides up here, Joellen. Well, and I also tried to cram a lot of slides into a short amount of time, so I might be able to take up some of Tiffany's and most of Greg's. <laughs> That's all right. Well, well, we appreciate you planning ahead. Like you almost knew this was going to happen. Um, but uh, you can see that there. That looks good. Perfect. Awesome. All right, take it away. All right, my name is Joellen Wilson, and today I'll be talking about restoring with purpose the where, why, and how of sportfish nursery habitat restoration. So Bonefish and Tarpon Trust is a nonprofit organization, and everything we do is science and research based for the main focus of conservation. Uh, the main three species that we focus on are bonefish, tarpon, and permit, but mostly their habitats. Florida's recreational saltwater fishery has an economic impact of over $10 billion a year, but this is dependent on healthy and available habitats. It's documented that Florida has lost about 44% of its wetlands, um, a third of seagrass in Florida Bay, and about 50% of mangroves statewide. And some of that comes in the form of mangrove habitat loss, like in Tampa Bay, or limited access due to mosquito impoundments or ditching, like on Florida's East Coast. So there are two sport fish that rely on these mangrove line, Tidal Creek and other back bay areas as juveniles, and that's the Atlantic tarpon and the common snook. Atlantic tarpon are a highly prized game fish through the southeastern United States. Um, they get really big, almost 250 pounds, over seven feet long. They're really fun to catch. A lot of times, as soon as you hook up, they're jumping. Um, very visual fish, especially for such a big fish. But they're also economically valuable. Tarpon make up a $465 million a year Keys Flats fishery um, in one coastal community on the west coast of Florida. Just local anglers fishing for tarpon generates $110 million annually. Another east coast community is $70 million a year. Now, snook are also culturally important throughout Florida. Um, some of our license plates feature snook on them. It also drives tourism because a lot of people come to Florida wanting to catch a snook. Snook are also a species of interest by our state management agency. Every six years, they host a snook symposium where they invite anglers and other stakeholders um, to talk about pretty much the state of the snook. Tarpon are predominantly catch and release only, except if you have a previously purchased tagged or in pursuit of a record. Snook um, have a six month seasonal closure in a very small slot size. However, since 2010, we've had a series of either cold kills or red tide events that have closed snook harvest for either the entire state or for certain regions throughout the state of Florida. Um, however, the fishery still has had issues on bouncing back. and um, being as both of these fish are predominantly catch and release, even with some naturally occurring events, we're still seeing declines. And that's directly tied to fisheries habitat and mostly juvenile habitat. Um, earlier this year, I was able to publish a paper um, along with colleagues at our state management agency that showed that even by protecting juvenile snook habitat and turpin habitat, um, there's also over 55 native species of other fish that are using these same habitats. So we can use snook as an umbrella species um, to protect habitats that are also going to, to trickle down to an array of other species. We can also use snook as a flagship species. So basically, um, snook in Florida could be the poster child for mangrove uh, tidal creek habitats. So the threats to these nursery habitat are uh, nutrient runoff. So think about our fertilizers um, from our lawns or golf courses. Also septic leaching. A lot of our coastal communities are still on septic tanks and some of them are below the waterline. 
Um, we also see altered freshwater flows. So you might have a natural creek um, that looks great, but if you look um, further into the landscape, it's heavily degraded with either agriculture or uh, development and communities, and that alters the, the freshwater flows into the tidal creeks, which in, impacts the habitat function. Um, you, we also have overall habitat degradation or total loss through coastal development. Some solutions to this are septic to sewer conversion, also protecting natural habitats, and finally habitat restoration. But we need to know, can habitat restoration be successful? Is it a solution to habitat degradation or loss? So one of our habitat restoration projects known to us as Coral Creek in Southwest Florida um, was a series of six, we call them canals, remnant canals, but it was basically a residential saltwater access um, home sites um, that were never able to be finished. The development project went out of business. Um, however, they're still tidally connected um, and DEP biologists found snook and tarpon in these canals. So what we wanted to do, since we essentially had six mini nursery habitats, is to test um, specific design characteristics. Um, we also featured a before and after monitoring, um, so that way we could tell if the project was successful. And this was a collaboration with our water management district that funds a lot of uh, restoration projects in our state. Um, also our local natu national estuary partnership um, and our state management agency. So the three different treatments that we featured were first a sill mouth. A lot of these coastal nursery habitats we find are ephemerally uh, connected. So there's not always water flow at all times of the year. Um, sometimes in our summer months or our high tides or our storm events, um, the fish are able to get in. Um, and then they're somewhat trapped, but that also doesn't allow bigger predators to come in. Um, so we wanted to see if that sill mouth was a feature that we wanted to include in future nursery habitat design. Um, the first treatment also has a deep hole. Um, because snook and turpin are spending multiple years in these nursery habitats, we thought of that as a temperature refuge. And that was uh, a feature that we found in other nursery habitats. The second treatment, kept the deep hole, but we did away with the, the sill mouth treatment. So it's open and flowing all year long for fish passage. Um, the third treatment, um, we added the sill mouth back in and then did away with the deep hole. We use passive integrated transponder or pit tags in order to tag and track juvenile turpin and snook. These work like a microchip for your pet. So they don't have a battery, but they do have a unique ID number. And this enabled us to track abundance, survival, growth, movement within the system, and then also final immigration numbers. Now pit tags are implanted into the abdominal cavity of the fish because they don't have a battery, they have to take some kind of charge. So at our monthly samplings, we would either uh, scan the fish to see if it already had a pit tag, or we um, implemented these autonomous antenna array systems that work kind of like an automatic toll booth system. So these were put in, these were put in at the mouths of each of the six canals and then finally the inlet. So we could see not only um, when the fish immigrated for a final time, but also how they were using the canals. Did they use one treatment at a certain size or age? Um, did, were all treatments used equally? Did they use the one directly across from the inlet? Um, or did they use the ones further from the inlet? Um, because it's not just important to know which features to put in, but maybe location matters as well. So before habitat restoration, we conducted six months of monitoring. Um, we caught 140 snook and one tarpon. This is what the Coral Creek canals looked like during habitat restoration. And this is what it looked like after habitat restoration. So there were some marsh gr grasses that were planted along the banks, um, but all of the mangroves are naturally propagating. So post-restoration results, we did 22 months of post-restoration sampling. And as you can see, we drastically increased um, the abundance, the amount of fish that are now in the canals. Um, this uh, is currently an analysis, but looking at before and after our growth rates also increased and immigration rates increased. So that just shows that habitat restoration can be successful um, and a tool to combat habitat degradation and decline. So it's so important that when you're doing habitat restoration that you have a quantitative metric for success. 
um, for us, that was the fish monitoring. Um, so we had the before and after, um, and we're able to use the fish life history metrics to see how well the habitat is functioning. Um, we also, it's important to have a specific design for a habitat or species. Oftentimes we see that um, some projects just kind of want to add a bunch of different elements in there and see what sticks. Um, when instead you really should be looking at the big picture of what you're trying to design for. And then ultimately these projects are to inform future habitat restoration projects. So that's why this project was so great that we could look at specific design elements and see which one was the most productive. So that way we can include those in the future designs. So our state management agency and our local county are already asking us, you know, where to protect habitats. Our water management districts um, who do restoration are asking where and how to restore habitats. And as I said, we're looking to inform future habitat restoration design. So our Coral Creek research tells us how to restore, but now we need to know where to restore. So in 2016, we established our juvenile tarp and habitat mapping project. Um, and that's where we asked anglers and just other residents um, to identify uh, tarp and nursery habitats. So of those, it was interesting that about two thirds were already degraded or altered in some form, meaning that they needed um, some type of habitat restoration. So we're able to generate maps like these, um, which obviously uh, the natural sites, we could recommend those for protection either through local or state agencies. Um, but then when it came to the altered sites, how do you know where to put your restoration dollars or your restoration efforts? So last year we started our um, restoration prioritization ranking system. Um, and really what we wanted to do was take the degraded sites and rank them using layers that included feasibility, biology, and connectivity uh, to determine how we wanted and where um, to restore. So I'll just give you one example of a ranking um, layer. Uh, the first one was publicly managed versus private lands. So obviously it's much easier to restore in locations that are already publicly managed or owned. Um, so this is what that data layer would look like. Um, and the publicly managed lands get a better score than the private ones do. So the other ones that we looked at were protected versus non-protected waterways, distance to wastewater treatment plants will also add in a septic layer. Um, our state management agency has an estuary prioritization layer that helps, especially when it comes to restoration funding dollars. Also distance to passes. I know I didn't go over life history, um, but these particular species spawn um, out offshore, either just out of the passes on the, the very island um, uh, beaches um, or with tarpon farther offshore. Um, so we've got to make sure that it's accessible by the larvae. Um, and then also how altered is the current site? Is it in need of just a small amount of habitat restoration versus a complete overhaul um, adjacent habitat? So after they immigrate from the system, is there actually natural habitat um, that they can inhabit? And then finally, we have an inland migration or a sea level rise layer that shows us um, models of where sea level rise will occur and how to make uh, the best choices for the habitat rest nursery, uh, habitat restoration locations. So now we have a map that can tell you where to protect, the map that can tell you where to restore. Our Coral Creek research can tell you how to restore. So our next steps are really to continue to locate these nursery habitats and add them to our ranking system, expand to other regions. So just outside of the county where we've been funded to work in. Um, we're actually pretty close to making this an online platform. So my hope is that, uh, Others can see, uh, you know, kind of click on these locations, create their own kind of ranking systems, see how we ranked ours. Um, but that way it makes it so much more accessible to other agencies. And also we're creating a vulnerability index. So the plan with the vulnerability index is to overlay our restoration ranking layers with potential development locations within um, this specific county or Charlotte County. So for example, we might have a location that's a, a natural or uh, one of our top priority restoration locations that is also slated for development, right? So then potentially our county will have that information in their database, they'll see that and they can either dissuade location, 
development from that location to another one. Um, there's also a potential for moving density units. Um, there's also a potential for incentivizing other locations, um, but basically creating um, a usable map um, that our county can use um, to protect these specific nursery habitat locations. We also plan to add hydrodynamics into this model and work with other potential agency layers that may be relevant to this uh, VI. So we're always looking for interagency collaborations and we really wanna apply the research. So not just to tarpon, but to other species, to other habitats, other locations. Um, really, this is just a case study. So that way it can be used for other places um, in other uses. But the ultimate goal overall is to include habitat and fisheries management plans. Um, currently, the approach is to use stock assessments that result in slot sizes or seasonal closures, but we still see declines in heavily regulated or catch early species like snook and tarpon. And this is directly due to habitat decline. So we now have the data on where to protect, where to restore, how to prioritize restoration and how to restore. And that could all be included in fisheries management plans. Because ultimately without healthy habitats, we don't have healthy fisheries. All right, that's it for me. Great, uh, well, thank you so much, Joellen and, and Tiffany. If you wanna, wanna pop back on, we can take a few questions. I know a handful have come in here, um, but I've got a, a, certainly a few off the top of my head that I, I've been wondering and I'm learning quite a bit here uh, from you all as well. Um, so maybe Joellen, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, obviously fish can swim and as much as maybe we, um, you know, try to keep them in one place. How do you guys account for, how do you all account for migration, especially with fish like tarpon and bonefish that are known to, to travel some ways um, in, your, in your management plans? Yeah, really good question. So the biggest thing for us is understanding your species, understanding um, their biological components. So where are they spawning? Um, that's a big thing for us, understanding all phases of the life cycle. So where are they spawning? Where are their nursery habitats? Um, where are their migratory um, uh, locations as they're moving into adulthood? Um, so really what we focus on at BTT is understanding each phase of the life cycle and specifically what that means for the species, specifically what that means for the connectivity, and then also the management in different locations. Great, and are you, are you all working with um you know, partner agencies or organizations and in, in throughout the Caribbean and other countries or is it yes. mostly based in the US? Very much so. So BTT has five scientists on staff. Um, I'm a little bit different because I do juvenile tarpon. So I have a little bit wider range, um, but three of our other scientists have specific locations. So one, we have a Bahamas initiative manager. So he handles everything through the Bahamas. We have a Florida Keys manager. And then we also have a Belize, Mexico manager. Um, so we really coordinate with state agencies, local agencies there, other NGOs um, to get a handle on connectivity, like you said, throughout the Caribbean and Central America for our species. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Tiffany, you know, you all at TRCP partnerships are obviously, you know, it's in the name. It's, it's the big P, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about how important it is to create partnerships specifically or especially with traditionally marginalized communities. Uh, and do you have advice for, for anyone in our audience who may be um, looking to, to build their community as well? Uh, great question. So at the TRCP, we have made a commitment and expectation that we integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion in all aspects of our work. And that includes in our partnership and it goes across all centers. So clearly with climate, we're talking about the majority of the impacts are impacting traditionally marginal, marginalized communities. So it has to be a part of what we're doing. We're actually working to get education and outreach to uh, communities of color and traditionally marginalized communities to be able to understand what nature-based solutions can do for them, to be able to understand how they can get funding for their community, to be able to do these projects and how they could work with the partners that um, that are on this panel today. But beyond that, um, we have a director of strategic partnerships that we hired. We take it pretty seriously. We where we have identified that not only is hunting and angling um, 
the majority white and even white men. And there is a need for diversity there. There's a need for diversity for the continuation of the community, for the continuation of habitat restoration. And with excise taxes connected to it, then we have to continue the practice. So uh, the director of strategic partnerships has actually been forming these really fantastic new partnerships with um, communities of color and, and not NGOs of, that are focused on communities of color. So Minority Outdoor Alliance, Hispanic Access Foundation, Outdoor Afro, those are all really great partners that we have had success with and um, are, are doing fantastic work. And I guess the advice that I would have for anyone wanting to, to work with traditionally marginalized communities is be real, be genuine, be truly interested um, in learning, be ready to learn because we often come to these things thinking that we are experienced and know a lot and um, we're, we're finding that we're learning a lot from our partners. Great, thank, thank you for that. That, that was a great response. Um, and I think that that probably perpetuates throughout a lot of the, you know, whether you work directly with um, you know, kind of the sporting universe or, or otherwise, um, I think those those thoughts kind of span the, the breadth of the outdoor community. Um, Joelle, and I guess you know one of the one of the biggest themes we often hear when we're when we're talking to groups is, you know, funding is always kind of an issue. Um, and and you know, Bonefish and Tarpon Trust has has been around for a little while. I, I admit I've been familiar with the organization for some time. Um, but you know, you you all have been seemingly fairly successful in acquiring you know state or, or federal grants to that matter. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, you know how you built those relationships with with your state agencies? I know you mentioned Florida, um, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Agency. How you've kind of built those relationships and and advice for anybody who may be you know, interested in starting down that path? Yeah, really good question. Um, so as far as funding wise, uh, BTT is, although we're a nonprofit, we do get private funding. We have an annual membership. Um, and then a lot of times we have industry funding. So for example, um, a boat manufacturer will fund our tarpon tagging project or, or something like that. So we can bring in dollars through that way. Um, but when we do um, apply for funding, um, opportunities, really um, get to know the people that are issuing um, the RFPs for your funding. Um, a lot of our funding lately has come through NOAA, um, and we have a really great contact in our region that not only tells us when the funding opportunities are coming up, helps us with the application, um, things of that nature. So understanding who you're applying to um, and really what they're looking for and going a step further instead of just looking at the RFP and going to the webinar, ask questions um, before you're starting to put in for that funding is really helpful. Um, and then also having your projects lined up. Uh, that's something that we've really been working on lately, especially with uh, this uh, uh, restoration ranking. So we have a series of projects. Some of them will fit into some funding opportunities, some won't, but we have ours prioritized. So that way when a funding opportunity comes up, um, we're ready and we know which one's the most applicable. And at this point, we're working on getting them down the pipeline. Um, when it comes to restoration, as you guys know, this is a multi-year, multi-phase process. Um, so understanding if you can get <clears throat> certain projects into design, all the way through to shovel ready. Um, that's important to know and important to understand where you want to start uh, getting your funding from. Great, and you know we had a, we have a few questions coming in, um, and this I think is a good segue. And, and Tiffany, I know you kind of spoke briefly about the infrastructure, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, and that money kind of hitting the ground. Um, and I guess specifically, the question is. Are your organizations able to measure the, the money value and range of the benefits of restoring habitats and how that impacts resilience? Um, is that something that you all are, are working on or plan to, to work on, Tiffany? You know, I think there are multiple studies that are being done actually by the government to be able to do this. And it's so necessary because oftentimes when you look at um, government funding, so part of this, there was a 1.3, 1.2 trillion dollars. So that's hundreds of billions of dollars that are supposed to specifically focused on public lands or habitat restoration that, that we could tap into. So yes, Martin, we are following that that funding. Um, what what hasn't been done very well, 
um, or hasn't been accepted maybe is the, val the valuation, the cost benefit analysis when it comes down to our types of projects, nature-based projects, restoration projects, and traditional things like the Army Corps and traditional FEMA um, gray infrastructure solutions, seawalls, et cetera. So those are very easy to value. And the nature-based solutions are have been um, a little bit more difficult to fit into the exact same box. When you measure them differently, they value very well. Yeah, and and Martin, I'll I'll even you know follow up if if you're or anybody out there. Um, I think it was about two weeks ago. Noah actually announced their spending plans for the infrastructure money. I think it's somewhere in the ballpark of three billion dollars uh, through a handful of grant programs that are available to the public. Um, we we published a blog on it not not too long ago. So if you're interested in that, you can you can head over to our website uh, estuaries.org. Um, Another shameless plug for, for Ray, uh, last year we actually released a report on the economic value of estuaries and that included quite a bit of information on the, uh, at least in case studies, we did six case studies across the country that included a, a good bit of information on the value of, of blue carbon and, and other nature-based solutions and what that actually provides to communities. Uh, it's a long read. Uh, but I think, you know, it's worth it if you want to sit down and dig through the numbers, you might be able to find, find some helpful information on that as well. Um, let me see what else we got here. Um, Joel, and how are stakeholders targeted for engagement around bonefish and tarpon trust initiatives? And are the stakeholders at the table uh, for the most part, are they recreational anglers or uh, other, other community groups? Really good question. So at this point, most of our fisheries research, um, we've been including what we call traditional ecological knowledge. Um, so when it comes into our, uh, especially tarpon, things like that, um, bonefish in the Keys, um, instead of looking at just catch data on fisheries declines, we've been looking at the guides, um, longtime locals, uh, other recreational anglers, um, and really getting those those surveys of how they see the fishery going um, and then also as far as stakeholder involvement we do um, you know part of tagging and tracking these fish is we've got to go fishing so <laughs> unfortunately we've, we've got to get on the water and yeah so we do build a, a large network of anglers both recreational and guides in order to uh, uh, get our fisheries data that's great and, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you guys have a, a pretty pretty wide um, kind of citizen science initiative through that that's either open to, to public or just through partner guides and, and commercial fishers or anybody that you work with or? It's totally, question? yeah, totally open to the public. Um, we received, uh, when we did our juvenile tarpon mapping project, we received over 300 locations, I think from almost um, 100 different people. And that's that's not just guides, it's anglers, um, anyone seeing a juvenile tarpon anywhere. Um, so we rely on the angling and stakeholder community quite a bit in order to obtain our, our data. Great, yeah, and I, I've not participated in, in tarpon angler science programs, unfortunately, uh, but I've done I've done some trout and some other species before and, and they're a lot of fun and it usually gives you a good excuse to get out and go fishing or go explore some new places. So uh, any anglers out there, uh, I encourage you to, to, there are a couple handful of different groups that, that offer programs like that. I know Trout Unlimited has one if you're uh, a little more inland, um, but they're, they're fun programs to participate in and you get to be a part of uh, live, you know, live science, um, you know, in, in real time. So um, encourage you to encourage you to do that if you're out there. Um, I guess Tiffany, one of the questions I have written down here, and, and we've got a little bit more time. So if anybody out there has any has any other questions, you know, feel free to type them in. Um, you know, how, how can or, or do you have any recommendations for maybe groups that aren't specifically hunter or angler focused, um, you know, thinking community organizations, faith based organizations um, to kind of engage with with the sporting community? Uh, obviously, we talked a lot about the theme of today's event has, has been how, you know, hunters and anglers and, and fish and wildlife habitat benefit coastal resilience and, and climate uh, resilience. Do you have any advice or any suggestions? 
for those kind of groups on how they can engage and where they can find um, those communities in, in their local regions or, or further? So another result from the poll was showing overwhelming support for different types of habitat restoration and conservation practices. After everything I, I just told about TRCP and our community, I feel like that's kind of a no brainer, but we weren't exactly sure when you write up, would you agree to this kind of policy? What's the answer gonna be? And the answer was yes, we support restoration, we support conservation. So you, you if you're wanting, wanting to engage the community, you should expect to have a ready audience because it's about access, recreation, a continued practice of their way of life. And we found that you're mostly there in making the connection to climate as a need for the work. So I would say it should be should be pretty easy and you don't have to hunt or fish to be able to approach anyone. And where to find them? Uh, one, of our, one of our funders was recently really surprised that we were having conversations about urban environments because hunters surely don't live in the inner city or in Atlanta. I was like, yeah, absolutely. They do. They just travel to the places where they need to, to be able to do the work. So you would find them anywhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, some of us are uh, unfortunately blessed with jobs here in urban areas. Right. So, you know, we don't, uh, we do got to drive a little further afield to, to find fish and fish and game, but uh, the journey is what makes it worth it. Right. Except when you don't see anything or don't catch anything. And then you say, why did I just drive two hours and waste all that gas? <laughs> To well, commune with it. nature. There you go. Right. Um, all right. Well, any uh, any last thoughts from from either of you before we go? Oh, Greg is here. Greg was able to get in, and he's connecting to audio. There you go. So it looks like there's a couple of questions in the chat about seagrass um, in Indian River Lagoon. So for William and Robert, if you guys are still on, I would recommend checking out um, Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Partnership go to their website, their executive director is Dwayne DeFries. And I just went to a seminar um, where he spoke and he's really up on seagrass restoration methods and they would have all of the data available for um, habitat restoration efforts and things like that for Indian River Lagoon. So I would check out, start by checking out their website um, and going through Dwayne. And, and I'll, I'll vouch for Dwayne. He's a, he's a great guy and yeah. we've, we've worked quite a bit with, with him and uh, the IRLC, uh, the Indian River Lagoon Council and the NEP down there for a while. So uh, he's a great resource. Um, well, Greg, I, I appreciate you joining. I'm sorry, you know, that uh, there were some technical issues there and you're able to, able to hop on here. Um, we've got a handful of minutes left. I, I don't want to, um, make your, your appearance in vain here, if there's anything you'd like to share. Well, Rob, I, I guess maybe I was mistaken. I had it as 11 o'clock invitation on my calendar, so I thought I was 15 minutes early. Oh, no. Um, well, we've got, we've got about 10 minutes. Um, I can, we can probably run through your slides real fast if, you, if you'd like. Um, Sure. I mean, if folks, if folks want to stick around and, and have time, be happy to do that. Um, yeah, we've I'd got, love to hear it. We've still got a still got a good um, a critical mass here of, of people. So I'll, I'll go ahead and pop those up real fast. And um, let me go ahead and get that going. And you can you can see that I can. Okay, well, go ahead when you're ready and just let me know when you want me to flip the slide. All right. All right. Well, thanks. Um, uh, well, thanks uh, for the invitation to sit on this panel. Apologies for running behind and, and not seeing the other presenters. Um, I suspect y'all have read my bio so far, so I won't, uh, in the interest of time, just won't go through that and bore you with any more. And I got a number of slides I'll go through pretty quickly here, and hopefully we'll just have time to touch them all. Next slide. So this picture captures uh, the struggle with coastal resiliency. It's uh, the juxtaposition of cities and infrastructure, farming and wetlands, uh, kind of pinched between mountains and rising sea levels. And here's where we find challenges as well as opportunities. Next slide. Uh, before I really dig into project examples, I'll just take a brief uh, overview of of Ducks Unlimited for those that may not be familiar. Um, our mission is to conserve, restore, and manage wetlands and associated habitats for North America's waterfowl. 
And these habitats also benefit other wildlife and people. And I think the stress here for this presentation is to think about DU's role with projects that do address other wildlife as, as well as the people components uh, when we consider resiliency and sustainability on many of the projects that we work on. Next slide. Since 1937, Ducks Unlimited has conserved more than 15 million acres of habitat in North America. And these red dots here just can depict where uh, those projects have been done. Um, we're the third largest land trust in North America with approximately 480,000 acres of conservation easements. We hold some land, but generally only temporarily while we work with a partner for a, a final disposition. While I represent Ducks Unlimited Incorporated, we also have other organizations, Ducks Unlimited Canada and Ducks Unlimited de Mexico that work together from a continental perspective of delivering waterfowl and wetlands conservation in North America. Next slide. Ducks Unlimited has a unique model in the conservation space where we employ not only biologists and scientists, but also professional uh, registered engineers uh, on staff. And those staff, along with uh, GIS specialists, land protection staff, uh, permitting and regulatory compliance staff, all collaborate in-house uh, together and with our partners for project delivery. This uh, allows us to kind of bring a, a whole host of expertise from project planning and habitat uh, management, as well as engineering design, alternatives analysis, and regulatory compliance processes, all kind of into the fold uh, for project implementation. Next slide. So, you know, we accomplish our mission uh, through kind of two primary approaches. Uh, one would be the process-based res wetland restoration, where we make or restore wetlands that can perpetuate and sustain themselves. Examples of those would be tidal marsh restoration or floodplain re reconnectivity or stream uh, restoration. And the other would be in the managed landscapes or managed conservation, where we mimic natural functions and values uh, and processes uh, but, but through some form of manipulation, whether that's you know, water control structures, levees, pumps, water management. Uh, so in the resiliency project examples, I'm gonna touch on three uh, pretty briefly here. Uh, one would be you know, the more traditional tidal marsh restoration. Another would be an enhanced marsh project. And then lastly will be uh, a managed working lands uh, project. All of these have elements for priority fish and wildlife benefit, public use, economic drivers, as well as ecosystem services. Next slide. So uh, here in the historic uh, Puget Sound is the tidal marsh restoration example in the North Puget Sound area. Uh, this site is the Lekway Island, uh, Skagit Wildlife Management Area near Stanwood, Washington. Historically, this was an estuarine marsh that was resort, resettled and reclaimed as farmland approximately 120 years ago. Located along the fringes of the Puget Sound, farm product, productivity became less viable in the late 1980s. Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife purchased the property primarily as snow goose wintering habitat when populations were stressed. Over time, WDFW used traditional wetland and plant succession practices of mowing, disking to promote annual forage for waterfowl. More and more, the site became wetter and wetter with perennial evasives being more dominant and thus reducing the desired habitat conditions. In this picture, you can see that the site is dominated by non-native reed canary grass, which is an invasive and it provides very little habitat value or foraging opportunities for migratory birds as well as native fish. <clears throat> Cost and resources to continue to manage properties in this way uh, generally become too prohibitive, but also the listing of salmonids in uh, the Puget Sound area um, with the recognition that off channel habitats are a limiting factor made it a primary selection to restore this site to a naturally functioning marsh with improved access to juvenile salmon rearing habitat. Next slide. So DU Engineering and the Permian team led a, an effort to develop alternatives in the final design for a tidal marsh restoration that would remove levees and infrastructure, fill artificial drainage district, 
ditches and excavate historic channels and tidal meanders. Strategic breaches in the levee were also incorporated. Here you see the red lines are areas where ditches were filled and the blue lines are excavated historic channels and, and new meanders to improve hydrology within the site. Conditions such as this would make the property more resilient to storms, floods, and even drought conditions. Next slide. Phase one uh, of, the prop of the project was kind of interior work where we went in and excavated all the channels and, and did all the inside features first because of the shortened construction season. And in phase two was in the subsequent summer where we breached the levee and introduced the tidal flow back into the site for the first time in 120 years. This project design also incorporated smaller channels that remain flooded during the lowest tides. That along with parking lots and a walking trail provide public access and recreation opportunities for the local community and, and visitors to the site. NOAA, among many other partners, were involved with this project, providing, providing financial and technical assistance. Next slide. The second project is an enhanced marsh in coastal Texas near Port Arthur. The photo on the left is from the 1930s before the Gulf Coastal Interwaterway was constructed. While that conveyance is important for the goods and services and economy of the United States, it also came with some unexpected consequences. The GIWW severed the natural flow of nutrient and sediment laden fresh water to coastal marshes, such as the one in this picture. Similar to coastal marsh degradation in Louisiana, over time the marsh subsides, vegetation dies, erosion increases, killing more vegetation, and eventually they're left with large pockets of open water and broken marsh that provide less value to coastal fishery species as feeding and nursery grounds. This also reduces the value to migratory and resident birds. So you can notice from the picture in the 1930s how dark and gray and vegetated that looks compared to uh, sometime around 2008, 2009 when that photo on the right was taken. And you can see how there's broken marsh and open water. Next slide. Here, here's another photo uh, at that same time frame where you can see the broken marsh and open water. Not only the GIWW, the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway, but also oil and gas development, hurricanes, and other hydrological infrastructure, you know, put stressors on this marsh. The black spots that you notice in the picture are actually dying vegetation with a soil and organic material around perennial vegetation, such as Spartina, pipe, Spartina pipe, patens is oxidized and eroded away. What's left is a root pedestal that's elevated above the marsh plain that eventually falls over and dies. The desired habitat for this area is a high marsh near or above mean higher high water, which is what is presumed from the 1930s image. The square area you notice in the photograph is called Lost Lake, which was levied by private landowners in the 1950s. Lost Lake has maintained a robust community of emergent freshwater and submerged aquatic plants while the surrounding marsh has slowly died and decayed. Also keep in mind that the importance of this marsh and surrounding marsh is to provide storm surge protection to local communities is extremely important. Port, Ar Port Arthur is a major oil and gas production area where as much as 45% of the nation's jet fuel is produced. Not to mention this is a community of well over 100,000 residents. So the, large, the loss of marsh further stresses the potential impacts from flooding and damages to this community during storm surges and hurricanes. Next slide. In, 19, in 2010, DU under contract to Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, the owner and manager of these marshes developed a beneficial use of dredge material plan with a neighboring LNG a liquefied natural gas facility for marsh renourishment. In order to keep its berth open for shipping, the LNG facility needed to dredge approximately 3 million cubic yards of silt and sediment. They could have placed it in an upland disposal site for as much as $4 a cubic yard. But Texas Parks and Wildlife was inter interested in taking this material and using it as a needed resource to help with marsh health and sustainability. 
after topographic and bathymetric surveys of the 1400 acre site were performed, Ducks Unlimited determined that uh, with Parks and Wildlife to raise the marsh elevation an average of 1.5 feet. Dredge was strategically placed in very aqueous consistency like chocolate milk, or as I referred to it as marsh mocha, to gradually flow and spread and settle into the marsh. Once target elevation was achieved, then the discharge pipe was moved to another location for continued discharge. Planted native marsh plants were also uh, incorporated in the site to restore the functions and values. Next slide. So here's an image from 2015 where the high marsh is dominated with Spartina patents and three stem bulrush. NOAA supported this project with funding and their regulatory moxie. Next slide. Last project is a managed working farm, uh, working land owned by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on the Oregon coast. Next slide. Establishment of the Nestucca Bay National Wildlife Refuge began in 1991 to provide habitat for several species of Canada goose, which at the time were federally listed, and particularly Aleutians and dusky Canada goose. While Aleutians have rebounded quite well, duskies still have a low population of approximately 14,000 birds. Coastal Oregon and Washington, along with the Willamette Valley, are the wintering areas for these birds. In order to maintain habitats for wintering geese, the refuge continues to manage a grazing regime on short grass. However, consideration of management to other trust species are also in play. Over the time that the refuge has developed their comprehensive conservation plan, or CCP, to direct management and restoration strategies for several species, for the wetland areas that I've colored here, they have determined three management regimes. Upton Slough is a primary area for grazing. It also has uh, private land ownership in the middle. The Lineston site is a tidal marsh restoration site similar to the Lekway project that I pointed out earlier in a presentation that Ducks Unlimited designed and restored back in 2012. And then the bay unit is another grazing property. However, this, this project is kind of a blend or this property's management is a blend of both providing for grazing and geese as well as other aquatic species benefits. Next slide. <clears throat> the bay unit has a degraded tide gate and, and silted in ditches that have negatively impacted the site's ability to drain and provide desirable grass conditions for cows and thus geese. Per the refuge's vision, DU has developed the design to replace the tide gate with a new structure that provides improved fish passage. We have also incorporated filling in many of the artificial ditches and excavating the historic interior meanders, along with the placement of riparian cover to address water temperature concerns and the placement of large woody debris in the channels to provide habitat complexity. This project will provide increased benefit and habitat for listed salmonids and including coho, along with other amphibians. While it's not expected that this project will be the most optimal fish or goose habitat, we hope the compromise to provide both will be a model that others, including local dairy operators, will consider and incorporate. Next slide. So here's an example of the muted tidal regulator, or the MTR. This is an improved tide gate design that meets Oregon's fish passage requirements by remaining open at least 50% of the time during the tide cycle. A combination of a side hinge gate along with a float mechanism keeps the door open longer and during low velocity exchanges to improve fish egress and ingress. In managed environments where tide gates and infrastructure are a must, this newer technology can provide access to critical off-channel juvenile salmonid rearing habitat while maintaining social and economic viability. In this area, the dairy economy, in particular supporting the Tillamook creameries is extremely important. Next slide. DU doesn't deliver our mission without partnerships. Working with public and private landowners and with public and private funding requires a level of trust and cooperation. We appreciate the opportunities that we had have over the years to deliver mutually beneficial and sustainable project outcomes. And we look forward to future partnerships. Here's a list of the, the primary contact staff that work in the coastal areas across the United States.
thank you for this opportunity to sit on this panel. And I appreciate you, Greg, and, and everybody for, for sticking around. And we appreciate the, you know, the insight here. There's some, some pretty spectacular projects and, and you know, we'll, we'll have to find a way to get you back on to talk a little bit more in depth. Um, but recognizing we're, we're a few minutes past the, uh, past the hour here. Uh, if you do have questions specifically for Greg, there's his, uh, his email is up there on the screen. Feel free to, to reach out to him directly, um, as well as our other panelists. This, uh, this whole thing will be posted to our YouTube channel here in the coming week or so. So uh, if you miss anything, want to watch it again, want to share it with anybody, feel free to, to check it out there. Uh, but otherwise, uh, happy Habitat Month. And uh, again, we look forward to seeing you all back in, uh, in New Orleans. Uh, in December, and uh, otherwise enjoy the rest of your afternoon or morning, wherever you're at. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thanks.